somewhere in a remote, uncharted region of the planet called Earth. Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. And remember, my friends, future events such as these will affect you in the future. Time and space. Contact has been established. We now transmit you direct to... Tales from the Silent Planet. Welcome to Tales from the Silent Planet. I am Daniel Schultz, and I'm here with my co-host... Nick Wells. And we have started this podcast to talk about science fiction and fantasy, and sort of talk about the things that go along with that writing, uh, just science. We plan on having uh, some scientists on at some point to kind of talk about their specialties, probably have an astronomer on at some point, and... Basically, we're just going to see where this podcast takes us. Absolutely. So, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, probably, you know, it'd be good to introduce who we are uh, so you all know kind of where we're coming from and our backgrounds um, in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, Do you want to go first, Daniel? Sure, yeah. I... I grew up in a family that watched Star Trek literally every day of the week during the 90s. The the reruns of Star Trek The Next Generation were watched every single day of the week. And there was... So that was how I grew up in my family, was as a big science fiction guy. And as I grew up, I moved away from sort of science fiction and fantasy. I read Lord of the Rings, I read Chronicles of Narnia, but I wasn't much into fantasy until... I became an adult, and a friend gave me a copy of the book A Game of Thrones. And I had been making fun of him and saying, ah, fantasy's stupid. There's no, you know, I I don't want to read that. Even though I had read Lord of the Rings and loved Lord of the Rings and loved Chronicles of Narnia, I didn't quite, I I sort of relegated fantasy, reading fantasy books to, to the super nerd. And I was, I'm more of a science fiction guy, I thought. And he gave me that book. He went and bought it from a used bookstore and gave it to me. And I read it, and I was, you know, there was there was stuff in that book that brought, isn't the greatest. And, but it was it was something I just immediately kind of gravitated towards as far as the style and the idea that you could explore these worlds that were much like Star Trek and that you were exploring strange new worlds, but it was from a whole different perspective with this this sense of wonder. But that's basically where I, my background in science fiction and fantasy is I grew up just loving science fiction, watching all kinds of Star Trek and reading the novels and everything. Ender's Game, Jurassic Park, books that really had to do a lot with with science. And then as an adult, I've got into fantasy stuff. What about you? So in my youth, I, I really didn't read much of anything, and uh, I really world i had some friends who did it and then my brother-in-law um was a was a dm he, he's just crazy into it and so he uh decided to run a campaign and i got involved in it and i loved it i had another friend recommend um r.a salvatore who you know i just loved wrist and uh many of the characters that he's written about um another friend that same another friend actually recommended aragon so i read through the inheritance books pretty quickly uh well listened to the inheritance books pretty quickly 
and then the floodgates just flew wide open and uh, audiobooks have um, really just opened. I've read, I've listened to more books than I've read and um, I probably get through a couple books a month, usually primarily fantasy. Um, my favorite books as of late have been um, by Rothfuss, obviously uh, the King Killer Chronicle, and um, by another less known author, but he uh, is up and coming and he's won a ton of awards with his book, Dawn of Wonder, Jonathan Renshaw, who, um, you know, we'd love to have on the show at some point, so, or the podcast, so, but that's kind of uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I actually just bought Dune, so I hope to get through Dune at some point and uh, kind of expose myself to more of the science, uh, the sci-fi end of uh, end of reading. Nice. So we'll be able to explore things together because it sounds like there's a lot of gaps in my sort of knowledge and getting into this late and for you as well. So yeah. Have you read Ender's Game? I have not. That it needs is to be not. rectified, like, immediately. <laughs> that is, is not my list. Uh, that, that is my second favorite science fiction novel after Jurassic Park, which a lot of people say, oh, that's a thriller. The science is, is wishy-washy and all this stuff. But no, that, that book is the greatest science fiction book. I mean, there's nothing better than the idea of using science to resurrect the dinosaurs and then them running amok in the park. And yes. the movie is great, but the book is just amazing. They're both fantastic, but the book, I just, it's definitely my favorite science fiction novel of all time. Duly noted. Yeah, so that's where we're coming from. Now, I think we've kind of touched on what we want to do with the podcast. We want to talk about these books that we've read. We want to talk about maybe where we think science fiction and fantasy are going in the future. What are some of the common themes or whatever really could be anything. But today I think we are going to be talking about the book you mentioned, the author Jonathan Renshaw's book, Dawn of Wonder. And this was a book that a friend of mine had recommended. And then you recommended it to me as well. And so I said, well, two recommendations within a few weeks, I should probably check it out. And so I did, I went ahead and I got that on Audible and I listened to that within, I think, five days. I told you I'd do it in three, but then things got busy <laughs> and I, I failed in that Herculean task of listening to a 30 hour audiobook in, in three days, but I, I did get it done in, I think five or six. So it wasn't, it wasn't too much longer than I said. I was pretty uh, pretty surprised. I don't know many people who power through audiobooks like I do. So, um, yeah, I was I was quite impressed when you uh, sent me that text within a week. Hey, I got it done. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I really got sucked in, and I think as we start to talk about this, the the thing for me about this book was that the writing was top notch. Like just my overall impression of the book is that. You know, the, Jonathan Renshaw is a fantastic author. And this, I should mention, this book is self-published. It's a self-published book. And usually when I think of self-published books, it's really hit or miss, usually miss. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was in the Navy, someone dropped off a big box of books. And someone said, oh, there's a box of free books over there. And I went over there and it was a book. It was like a fantasy book. I said, oh, yeah, I'll get this. It's, I like fantasy books. And... It was a self-published novel, and it was terrible. The, the prose was just <laughs> was garbage, and I couldn't even make it through the first page. I felt bad, you know, like someone spent a lot of money to like print these books out, and, and they lived their dream by doing it. But it was I couldn't do it. But with Dawn of Wonder, that was not the case at all for me. Like right off the bat, you can tell that this guy has a clear idea of where he's going in the story, and he's got a grasp of writing that's strong enough to make it to a publishing company, but he's probably making more, he definitely is making more money going the self-publishing route, at least at this point. As a first-time yeah. author with a fantasy novel, he wouldn't have gotten that much money, but as a self-publisher, I assume that he is making a lot more money. But what are your overall impressions of the book? Is you've re you read it how long ago? Oh, that is a, that is a great question. I think uh, February... 
was my first um, go at the book. And I had happened across it, I think, based upon an audible recommendation. And um, it's kind of one of those few times where I'm like, ah, Dawn of Wonder, you know, it's a, it's a catchy title. You know, it kind of made me think of actually, um, uh, what was that movie where um, Alec Baldwin played the voice of Santa Claus and there was Jack Frost? Um, anyway, um, you, some of you probably know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, I can't uh, think of the name. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, you know, and uh, that movie kind of got the word wonder to come alive for me because um, Santa Claus was the one who was filled with wonder. And it, 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 I don't really know how to describe it, but the word just came alive to me in just unique ways. And because um, before it's like, oh, wonder, what, whatever. But wonder, it's like uh, it's like a child looking at a brand new thing and, and just having it be you know, amazing and exciting. And so when I ran across the title, it was just like, okay, you know, he has a, he has some pretty large shoes to fill with this kind of a promise from the title. And, um, I think the first four hours of the book are my favorite in the whole book. The whole book is phenomenal, but, um, I think that his world building, the way that he is immersive and his descriptions with his writing, uh, really just pulled me in and held me captive. I just, I couldn't put it down. Um, I didn't finish it my first time through quite as quickly as you did. At that point, I wasn't listening to audiobooks as vehemently, but, um, you know, I just could not wait to get to the next chapter every time. And, um, well, that's one of the things you said as, when you recommended it and we were first talking about it, uh, before I read it and you, you said that those first, that first part of the book. So let's, let's talk about the premise. The premise of the book is it's about this young man named Aiden. And he is just a normal, you know, basically a normal kid. He's, he's a pretty smart, intelligent kid, but he is living in a small village. And through circumstances, he ends up having to flee that, that village. But you, and then eventually he goes and he starts to learn to be what in the book is called a marshal. And this is sort of a, a secret agent, sort of a diplomat position within this country that they live in. And that's the overall premise of the book. But you, you talked about that first part of the book as being the best writing, some of the best writing you had, had read. You said that that really drew you in and made you love that character of Aiden. And what was it about that first part where he's in the village, he's interacting with his friends and the troubles start in the village. What was, what was it about that part of the book that really got you into it? So we will do our best to not throw in any spoilers, uh, just as a note for anybody who's on the edge of their seat thinking they want to read this book. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. So I'll be honest with you. Tolkien is a phenomenal author. Um, but I think that when he was writing fiction, he was kind of one of the guys paving the way for fiction um, at that time and making it into, I don't think it was an intention, but they made, he was one of the guys who made it into a legitimate um, genre is in writing. And so when you read Tolkien, you have to understand that he, he was one of those guys who kind of paved the way and guys who come after him um, have kind of evolved uh, the genre. And so when I read Tolkien, I don't have that immersive type feel like he's a, he's a very good plot and he kind of moves it along very quickly and he does throw detail in, but it's kind of, I, I don't want to compare it to virtual reality, but it's almost better than that because when I read Renshaw, mm -hmm. for those of you that don't aren't familiar with him, which is probably most people, he, he actually was an English teacher. So he knows the language pretty well. I would, I would assume his writing is phenomenal. Like you said, self-published, uh, there's not any grammar mistakes that I'm aware of, but anyway, uh, the way he writes, it just draws, it makes me experience it. Like if the way he describes, um, a visual makes me just picture it vividly in my head, the way that he talks about the main character and what they're feeling. It's not like he tells you, and he felt this, but, he just used descriptive, he uses descriptive language to make you feel that. And so 
really the thing that drew me in more than anything um, was his ability to make me associate with Aiden and to um, become emotionally connected with him and to want what he wanted and to, um, you know, have the reservations that he had and to see the world through his perspective and become immersed in it. And so I think, at least from my perspective, uh, that is what Renshaw did to draw me in. And um, I, haven't been, I haven't read many authors who can do that in quite that same way. So, yeah, it just, just hooked me. So were you, where you would see Tolkien as this grand myth maker who's kind of telling you this story about something that could have happened in a long history a long time ago, Renshaw actually makes you feel deeply with this one character and his struggle and that sort of drew you in at a level where you connected with Aiden instead of sort of experiencing the world through the the grand scope of something else. Yeah, I think that Tolkien specifically, I mean, if I understand it correctly, I've never read the Psalm really, and, but I think that he created that whole language and that whole history before. Yeah, so he... He had been working on that since basically World War One. Yeah. After World War One and around that time, he started to create languages and this culture. And The Silmarillion is one of the hardest books I've ever I've ever read because it's just so dense and it's full of so much information. It's kind of hard to get through at points. But that whole world is just fleshed out to this insane degree. And things like The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings are sort of this small part of the book. And so he's kind of trying to condense this whole world into this, you know, these smaller sure. stories. And I can see where, with Renshaw's book, you, don't, you maybe don't have that level of, of world building where you have all these vast languages and you figure them out where they can actually be spoken like, right. like Tolkien, because he was, that was his job. He taught language as a philologist, but with Renshaw's book, the way that first part after you had sort of said that really drew you in, I paid really close attention to that first part and to try and see what was it that drew you in and what I experienced that same thing. And I think we talked about Patrick Rothfuss earlier. You you mentioned him. Yeah. And one of the things about Rothfuss is you're dealing with one character's point of view and that he's actually telling this story to someone else. And he may or may not be a reliable narrator, but with yeah. Rinshaw, you have one character's point of view, but it's third person and you're you're just dealing with this it's one character and what happens to him specifically. And I think that writing is really similar to Rothfuss and that you're able to connect with this one character and yes. see him experience troubles and things. And there was something about Aiden in the first part of this book where a lot of characters, when they're really smart like he is, he's, you know, I think somebody calls him a prodigy in the first part yep. of the book. And sometimes that makes you roll your eyes and be like, okay, of course, you know, he's the world's greatest kid, but there's little flaws in the book in Aiden's character that you can see. Okay. I can see where that's going to play in later. There's yes. little things that he does, little arrogance and, and stuff like that, that plays into him and pride. And there's also big problems that becomes a, a major point of the book, but the, Rinshaw obviously spent a lot of time thinking about how this character was going to not only interpret the things around him, but interpret how we were going to interpret him. Sure. And I think, I think that's probably one of the key things that, that drew you in. It definitely was something I, I saw was that Aiden felt like a real character. He felt like someone that you could actually meet on the street and be like, I knew a kid like that who was... Yes who was really smart and at the same time, like a nice kid, but he had that little bit of arrogance where you're like, yeah, he thinks he's better than me. And, <laughs> it, and he's probably, he probably is, but he shouldn't think it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, what, what, as the book progressed, 
it got past that initial part, which I will agree was uh, just, you know, fantastic opening and really set the stage for the rest of the series. And we can't really talk. We don't, I don't want to talk too, too many specifics about where yes. the book ends up, but obviously he, he has to leave the village. He goes and some, uh, some other stuff happens and he winds up in this bigger city and he's learning to be a marshal. What did you think as the story progressed to that point? And he was, he was in classes and he was, learning all these skills. What did you think about that part of the book? Yeah, um, let me just jump back for one quick yeah, second, sure. then I'll definitely get to that. Um, so just uh, just in regards, well, while you were talking, and kind of, I just want to make this point. Um, I would more compare, because we're you talked about Rothfuss, I would compare more Tolkien's, I don't want to say he's story-driven, but because he does flesh out all the characters really well, and he world-builds amazingly. Um, and I would say that, uh, Renshaw's world building is wonderful also. It's just probably not, the breadth of it isn't quite as large, obviously. But um, I would say Brandon Sanderson, I, I'm reading through um, The Way of Kings right now, where you're going from multiple people, you know, multiple perspectives. That's that To me, that's more like a lot of the Lord of the Rings. And so you don't have that ability to focus on that one person and it's not being told from their perspective. Whereas um, Dawn of Wonder is more that way, just like, uh, you know, you're hearing the story from Kavoth's perspective in, in the King Hiller Chronicle by Rothfuss, his books. Um, and so they're just different kind of books. They're both amazing in their own ways and, and you can take different things from both of them. Um, and the thing with stories like this one, too, with Donald Wonder and um, with specifically Aiden and Kvothe are you don't write stories about average people generally. You can. Um, and I think that that would make for a phenomenal story where you, where you do talk about some of the average and, and you know, but 99% of the time, I feel like um, you need to have an extraordinary character if you're going to have a book be around a character. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, a lot of people, I have heard hangups about that, but you have to realize you want to read the book in, in a real sense because there is something extraordinary about that person and, and it's going to carry them to extraordinary things. Um, now, as far as Aiden getting into the martial training, um, yeah, there's, it's hard to not talk about specifics, but... Um, uh, I think I think that it's phenomenal. Um, you really see Aiden. Oh, what what to say? How to say it? Uh, the way that Renshaw writes, he he studies his material really well. Um, and so, like for his new book, the sequel to Dawn of Wonder that's coming out, he went to Israel to learn Krav Maga so that he could write better about hand to hand combat. And I, and that's the kind of writer he is. He's immersive, and so. When he's writing about something, he he wants to write in such a way that it can make you, it can bring you into that world and and almost uh, bring you as close to experiencing it as you can. So when he's going through the various types of training, um, and just for those of you, I don't really think this is a spoiler. Um, the great he's uh, he's training to be a gray marshal, and there's like the city guard, and in the book he talks about how. Um, the Grey Marshals, I think two of the Grey Marshals just took out 10 of the city guard. You know, it's like, these are the elite of the elite. Um, you know, these are the guys that everybody uh, wants to be, or some people don't want to be them because they're too intense. So the training is very um, thorough, and uh, Aiden gets a group of friends, um, I think probably four or five characters, really, who get... Um, who they all feel like real people. Like you said, Aiden just seems like this kid who you, you, you might meet on the street or might, who you might know somebody like. But uh, there's the characters that he becomes friends with who are all unique and they're not wooden. They're not vanilla. They're all very, um, they're all very real. That's what they, they're archetypal characters and you've seen those characters before, but I think Rinshaw does a good job of making them seem like you know, not just cardboard cutouts of those types of characters, but they actually do show personality beyond this trope there. Yes. One character in particular who I, um, 
I'm really excited for him to flesh out some more. You'll find his, uh, his name is P shot. That's his nickname. And um, just the way he kind of subtly lays the groundwork for kind of who he's going to make him into um, really has me kind of on the edge of my seat to find out more about his character and how he can contribute to the story uh, in a unique way. Um, I guess as far as tropes go, he's more um, kind of more of the character I would lean towards if I were playing like an RPG or something. Uh, if it were Skyrim or something, the, the character I would pr- probably gravitate more towards. So, um, you know, he he writes very well about them, but he also leaves a lot a lot to, um, to kind of figure out about them. And that's one yeah. of the things is with the character, these characters other than Aiden, he sort of hints at their backstory. And yes. that, that they had lives before they met Aiden. And that's one of the things where, you know, like, okay, this guy actually knows what he's doing because some characters just seem to walk, in some books, just seem to walk on screen and then they're done. Uh, I mentioned, we talked about R.A. Salvatore earlier, and he's written some good stuff that I, I sort of enjoyed. But there were times in some of those Dritz books, the early ones, where you felt like, this character is just sort of walking on, and I don't really think about what they did before and after Dritz was there. Yeah, and that you know that that's it's a that's just a dragon's book. It's not really supposed to it's supposed to be about Dritz. Not supposed to be about these other characters, and that's not a criticism of him. But with Rinshaw, like you, you find I, at least I thought, especially with Peashaw, is there's these h- things hinted about his background, and it makes me wonder how did he get to the point where he's at this Green Marsh at this Marshall School. You know, we sort of know how how Aiden got there, but P-Shot's background that's into that seems like it's just as unlikely and just as, you know, uh, sort of uh, out of the blue thing that he would be accepted into this school and he would make it. And yeah. I, I'm I'm really excited to see how that that story develops with him as well. I forget the name of the character. I, since I listened on, uh, to it on Audible... I, the names are not sticking with me as much because, you know, they're fantasy names. They're not like a yeah, normal yeah. name. If I had read it, I'd probably remember it well. But uh, the female friend that they make. Liru? Liru, yes. She was one that I, I really liked. I thought she was feisty and sort of, uh, you know, sort of stood out as as one that I would somebody that I would have enjoyed being around as a kid where she's really yeah. nice, but she's also got this like sarcastic, this sarcastic uh, personality where she's always ribbing Aiden. And sometimes he just doesn't seem to get it. But, like she's not, she's being, she's making a joke and she just plays it completely straight. And well, like there's a scene where I think she says something and he doesn't get it until he sees her the next time that she yeah. was making a joke. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really liked her. Yeah, she's great. Um, I've actually, I think I've listened to the audiobook three times now, maybe four. Mm-hmm. So I've um, I've kind of familiarized myself with it a little bit. Um, I actually uh, had the opportunity to kind of message Renshaw back and forth. Um, quite a, not a ton, but a bit. Um, I actually managed to finagle my way onto the beta team so i'm really excited to uh to eventually jump into that and uh see what that's all about so i, I won't reveal anything obviously here but... uh, terrible i'm i'm, I'm a little <laughs> jealous but, but at the same time i i think i'd rather wait until i can see the final thing and i'm not having to to wonder if there's gonna be a big change or something but no that is that is cool so and you were gonna say no, no, go ahead. Go I was going to ask you, since you've read it a few times, was there were there things that you picked up on maybe the second or third time through that you didn't see at first or didn't didn't realize at first, or something you enjoyed more as you read it again and again? Yeah, I think that he has some things thrown in. Um, I'm not going to be specific because uh, I don't want to. I don't want to like point them out and have you looking for them because it's something that I think you'll enjoy more for discovering. Uh, I think the first time through a book, you know, you're just kind of trying to get a sense of the world and gathering your bearings with it. Um, second time through is really when I started to pick up on smaller details where it's like, hey, I, I don't remember this fitting into the world so much. Um, I wonder how I wonder if that's going to get fleshed out in the next book. Um, 
you know, or, or what that means exactly. And so, um, again, I wish I could talk about more of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the, the beginning of the book and the end of the book kind of have, um, similar, a similar starting point. Like when he really embarks on his journey, like the climax of the beginning, um, actually is kind of tied into the ending a little bit in a way that I actually asked him about in uh, Jonathan Renshaw. And he, you know, he was, he knew he had done it. He, it wasn't like this big major focal point that you should make too much out of, but um, he's like, yeah, you know, I did that. And um, it was just like, once it, once it hit me, it's like, man, that's, that was really good writing. And it makes me so much more excited for the next book to see how much more he can flesh out and what you can learn about in the first book that um, he might expand upon uh, just with, you know, stuff that wasn't so touched on. There's only so much you can do in, a, in one book. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot you can pick up on. So I would, I would encourage uh, a few reads for sure. Yeah, I think I'm going to give it a little bit of time and then come back to it and probably listen to it again over a longer period of time and kind of think about things more as I got went through. I, I listened to it on a, on a, I think like 1.5 or two times speed and got yeah. through it pretty quickly. And that helped to get through it so that we could talk about it. But I, I think I'm going to go back and, and definitely read it. One of the things that stood out to me was sort of the I guess you could say the religious overtones of the book there Rinshaw's a Christian as are we and the book you know it deals with with religion not as maybe the focal point of the book it's not based you know just overtly there but there are their religion is mentioned and there's multiple religions mentioned in one section of the book that I remember in particular. Yeah. And what? I think it was, it was, they were talking about it in, at the warden school. And I think P shot was the character that just like yeah. offended everybody. And like, <laughs> yes, yes, he was. <laughs> and that was, that was a pretty, pretty funny, but there is a scene. I don't know. I guess, should we, we talk about, the specific scene or talk about the, yes. the part of the book where there is a specific scene where, I don't know, do you want to kind of describe it? You probably yeah. get more justice than me. No, no, I would love to, I, you know, and um, it's something I've been kind of looking forward to all day. Um, I didn't go back and re-listen to the chapter, um, but, you know, it is just phenomenal. So um, in the book at some point, I mean, he, his Christianity comes out in the book. Um, you can tell his worldview pretty quickly, um, you know, in his writing of Aiden. And I really appreciated that. And it makes it a book that I'm excited to read to my daughters. I have two children, uh, happily married, and, you know, the book is very, very clean. Um, I think there might be one or two swear words in it, but they're not bad. It's just, it fit the context. And But, um, you know, it's a book that I look forward to reading to my children. And, and morally, the main character is somebody to, he's not perfect, but he's great. Uh, is, and he he kind of grows, but um, he has, so for those of you that are Christians, you know, you're familiar with Isaiah 6, where, you know, he's before the throne, and it's just like this impossible to describe situation where Isaiah, you know, comes before God and it's just, you know, anybody who's familiar with Isaiah 6, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard for me to explain without reading it. I'm not going to read it here. Well, but he has he, this overwhelming like, sense of his own inferiority to God's yes. holiness. He says, yes. like, woe is me. Like, I am undone. Yes, yes. And, you know, Aiden has an encounter, um, I believe he's called the Ancient One, in, in the books here, who is the primary deity, um, at least of the one religion. And, um, you know, and it it is very, very reminiscent of Isaiah 6. Um, I'm hesitant to say it's perfect or anything in that regard, just because I, uh, I don't want to build it up into something that it shouldn't be. And, you know, certainly it's not scripture, but it is the best treatment of of who God is and who we are, uh, you know, as sinners in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God, um, 
where we have nothing to bring and uh, we, we just have him to rely on for, for our benefit. Uh, is he's our benefactor. And so um, I would highly encourage anybody who is a Christian to uh, definitely check out the book just for that because, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, but uh, just because it is, for me, it was like, man, I need to go tell everybody I know to read this. I want to hear what other Christians think about this. Um, I know that you were really pumped about it when you read it. So I'm glad that I I wasn't, uh, you know, delusional <laughs> in my uh, estimations of it. So, um, yeah, I loved it. What do you, what did you think about it? I, I liked it. And one of the things that I, I was sort of messaging you as I was going through the book. When I get to a, a really cool part that I was excited about, I'd, I'd text you and you, you'd say something like, oh, man, that's a great part, but just wait, just wait. And yeah. I, there was some things that stood out to me, and I think this is one of the the quotes that, some of the quotes that got to me was Aiden meets the ancient one. He has that overwhelming sense of, his own sin. And he says, the book says about Aiden, he'd always thought of himself as good and noble of heart. And throughout the whole book, Aiden has been, you know, doing the, the morally right thing. And he's, you know, he's been trying to help people and, and this stuff. And then he gets to this point where he sees, you know, essentially this, the holiness of the ancient one of how, how much, more perfection is than what he thought it was. And yes. I, that, that seems like, like you were saying right out, out of Isaiah six and some of the, the Pauline epistles where you have this, this sense of God is perfectly holy and our own meager attempts to do anything good just can't stand up to it. And then the other quote from that, that point of the book that stopped me was, was he would be thrown out, should be thrown out. That would be justice. And that was yes. what Ian was thinking was that, yes. like, like he realizes like he doesn't belong in this court with this perfect being in the presence of a perfect God, essentially. And not only should like he be thrown out of there, but that would be justice. Like justice should be him away from this perfect being. And yes. yet here he is like being shown like, like a, a great grace essentially. And, oh, yeah. and you think like, man, in the context of the book and how it's built up to that point, it's not just like this random thing that happens. It has been building to this point in the book. And you, it, it feels just right. And I, I was reading, I went back and I read some of the reviews and a lot of, you know, there's had great reviews on things like Goodreads and Audible, but some of the reviews mentioned that point in the book and they said, oh, it's a deus ex machina, you know, like, like got like a literal one where God saves them and stuff. And it's in, from the Christian perspective, like everything that happens is a deus ex machina. Like anything good that happens is because God yes. has decided it. And there's this term in Tolkien's writings, it's called a catastrophe. It's basically the opposite of a catastrophe. It's something that happens in a split second that's for good, and it's something that God does. Yeah. And that was sort of this catastrophic. Uh, that's not even, I, it's a made-up word in the first place, but <laughs> that, this moment where God comes together in this catastrophe, and, you know, it feels right, and it feels good, and that's the point in the book where Aiden sort of overcomes this problem that he's had that he hasn't been able to deal with. Yes. And he manages to overcome that. And it's not through his own power. It's not through something he was, you know, that he was able to do of himself, but God comes and changes him in that moment. And he realizes the, not only his own position within the world and, you know, under God's sovereignty and, but his interaction with others changes. And I thought that that fit, you know, the way that the character developed and it seemed realistic because of the particular problem he was having. Yes, absolutely. And 
The thing I love about Renshaw is I didn't know he was a Christian until after I was probably about eight hours into it. And and a lot of what he was, the morals were resonating with me. I'm like, man, this is so good. This is so foreign to me uh, to hear these things. And I mean, you know, most most characters and most protagonists uh, do have a generally good moral base as far as uh, most people are concerned. But this was kind of different. And so I looked up Renshaw and I just I scoured his website. And uh, I believe it's in his About Me section. He's revamping the website now. But in the About Me section, he says, you know, I am a Christian, and this informs my writing. And he was just unashamed about it. And he's not pandering to uh, people begging for them to read his stuff, to buy his book, so that he doesn't have to be a teacher. You know, he he's writing for the glory of God, and he's trying to redeem that for God's glory. And, and I love that. Um, you know, specifically like with Aiden, like you were saying, reading some of those quotations, Romans fourteen twenty three kind of kind of gives us the principle: whatever isn't done in faith to God is sin. So, like even though Aiden does, uh, you know, what most people can consider altruistic things, things that didn't benefit him but were for the good of somebody else, uh, you know, even to him, you know, that that wasn't good because he wasn't doing it for the ancient one. He wasn't doing it for God and. Um, you know, and I think I don't think that that's Renshaw's point there, but uh, maybe I'm interjecting my own worldview into that. But um, you know, certainly it uh, just everything about it screams screams the gospel mm-hmm. and uh, points you to that, and and that's why it's so exciting. It's like, man, you know, in a culture where you know that's offensive uh, to rely on to rely on a crutch you know, for, for your security and for your peace of mind, um, that you have this, this upcoming, this, this author who, um, presents it in that way. And like you said, the reviews largely are just, you know, five out of five, you know, love the book, love the book, love the book. Uh, you know, and, and those aren't all Christians. Uh, probably the majority are not. Yeah. And um, I didn't run across too many reviews that brought up that part specifically. So I, I kind of looked uh, through to see the negative ones because a lot of times you can see by, by looking at negative reviews you can kind of see what that person thought of the book in a way that not you know they'll if they actually write a review and they just don't give a one star you can kind of see okay what parts of these books can you know of any kind of medium what kind of part could they have improved or could they have improved or could they have done sure. something to change this person's view and that was something some like a lot of them were just oh i couldn't get into it uh, it's you know uh, but that one review i read where it mentioned that it was it, i think it was actually like a it wasn't a five-star review but it was you know it was a sort of a medium review and i thought that the, the person was just like oh you know that it they, I think they might have accused them of sort of a, a pandering approach. But I know that a lot of the, some of these, I haven't read a lot of Christian fantasy books as far as books written by Christians, but I know one of the strong criticisms of them is that they often have just this just like thinly veiled Judeo Christian like worldview that, that just like, like clearly it's just Christianity, but it's, they, they make up some name. But I didn't get that with. Renshaw because the focus of the book was Aiden's journey to that point. Yes. And yep. he's not, the point of the book was not to just share this, you know, to, to have this thinly veiled gospel message that, you know, but rather to show how the gospel is, transforms people in a way that can even happen in a fantasy book. And it wasn't it, it, like, it, like I said, its primary purpose wasn't to just pander or to proselytize, but was to say, Hey, this, this is my worldview and this is how I see how things impact the world. And it just felt natural to the yeah. rest of the book. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, yeah. Highly recommend the book. It, uh, you know, if it, um, if it is disappointing to you, I apologize. We apologize. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, if you look up the reviews, let the reviews do the convincing um, because it, it just, he knocked it out of the park. And the reviews are, are just proof of that. So. And one of the things is it's really relatively inexpensive. I think what the ebook is like $5 or is that? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, yes, it was. So it, it's it's relatively inexpensive. You're supporting the author directly as opposed to them getting a small royalty, you know, percentage. But that money's going straight to them, and he's working on the second book at this point. And the first book felt like a complete story, and especially like I was thinking as we were talking about the first part of the book felt like its own contained story that this yes. was the story of this part of his life and then it provided for the next part and it just felt like this continuous cycle of these short stories that fit into this narr- you know the narrative of Aiden's life and the second book felt complete this is I'm ready for the second book because the first book not only felt complete but it set up uh, you know really something I'm really excited for in how it plays out in the further in the further books but I yeah. read in a Obviously, Rinshaw is taking his time to make sure that this book lives up to it. They all, yeah, there's that thing called the sophomore slump that people have where often their follow-ups don't seem as good. And he's really trying to make sure that he is uh, is, is going to deliver on what he, what he has promised with bringing us this book. Yeah, and, and one thing I just... I, there are two moments in literature that have really just had me literally like holding my breath, like just, just on, I know I said on the edge of my seat before, but literally just like better than TV, better than movies, you know, just my favorite, there's two, I have two moments that really stand out in my mind in, um, in fiction. And uh, one is in Dawn of Wonder and one is in the Name of the Wind by Rothfuss. Um, Rothfuss is more well known, so I'll give you the comparison. Toward the end of the beginning part of the book that Daniel mentioned, um, there's just this moment. It's like the climax of that part where it's just like it's happening and you're just like, oh, man, it is so exciting. I would compare it to the part in Name of the Wind where Kvothe is at the Aeolian. Um, I don't really think this is a spoiler at all, um, but Quoth is in the Aeolian, ready to do his first performance. And those of you that know the book know how much is riding on that and know the tension and know everything that's going into it. And if you, you know, enjoy that half as much as I did, um, you know, this is one of those moments where it's like, you know, this is the all or nothing. Um, you know, this is this is this is huge. And, you know, it's just like you're on the edge of your seat holding your breath. You know, and you just want that character so badly to succeed. And um, it, it it's just phenomenal writing. Uh, you will not be disappointed, I promise. Yeah, I, I think that's a good comparison with that part in, in Dawn of Wonder, where the whole beginning section of the book has built up to this point, And you, you can see how everything flowed into this one scenario, this one action that has to happen. And that is a good comparison in... Uh, in the name of the wind where at least in that portion of the book it's built up and there's a lot of writing on it I I do like that comparison because both of those both Rothfuss and Renshaw were able to draw you in to this point where you are invested in the character and you want to see them succeed and it's right at the cusp of failure or success and that's what I think a great a great author does is they're able to not only make you feel like the world could exist and these characters could exist, but they make you want to care about them. Yeah. And I think that, that sort of trans transports us and uh, kind of can take us into our next portion of what we're going to talk about today, which is National Novel Writing Month. Yes. Which is coming up here in November and depending on when we release this podcast could have already started. But we are both going to attempt at National Novel Writing Month. And for you, those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically, uh, November, the goal is to write 50,000 words during November and uh, to write what is the the low end of a novel. So you're writing a novella or a a novel, a short novel. It's about 200 pages of what it is, what 50,000 words comes to approximately. Um, for those of you that aren't just familiar with it, uh, there is actually a website. I'm, I'm assuming it's National Novel Right National Novel Writing Month. dot com. I would just Google it. Uh, you can actually submit it to them. It's not like a real contest. If you actually do it, they check it with their word check 
tracking software, but uh, they'll actually send you a certificate. It's you know just more of a personal accomplishment thing that they give you. It doesn't really doesn't really you know give you any qualification for anything, but it's just kind of this cool thing. Um, I know I've never Daniel's the one who mentioned this to me. I, I never really knew about it. Um, I love the idea of writing. It's just I'm not. <laughs> I'm not very good at it, so I've never studied, um, I've never listened to Stephen King or read his book about writing. I've never, um, you know, attended any classes really that taught you what makes a good story. Uh, Daniel really has given me some resources and pointed out that I, I write in the passive uh, passive voice quite a bit, so I, I have a long way to go, uh, so it'll be... It'll be a good month, let's put it that way. But Daniel, you are a veteran. Yeah, I have failed at NaNoWriMo four times already. I've failed to reach the 50,000 words. I, I think my my most successful year was last year. I think I, I missed it. T told you I did like 20,000-something uh, words, I think, was how much I got. And that was, yeah. that was pretty – I was pretty proud of that. But I think the point of – National Law Writing, but obviously it'd be fantastic to write the whole 50,000 words, but it's really to promote writing in general. And it's something where as culture has moved more to a visual medium and how people access information, not only, you know, television is kind of being phased out more to the internet. And even this podcast where we're talking about books is something people are going to listen to and not read. And so National Novel Writing Month is one of these initiatives that's sort of trying to get people to to write. And like any good science fiction or fantasy fan, eventually you want to kind of get, you want to kind of write something yourself. And I don't know if that's just something that's inherent to science fiction and fantasy, but there's something about those <laughs> genres that like motivates nerds to get up and try to do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it's weird because I think pretty much everybody I know that does read uh, science fiction fantasy wants to do it, or maybe not, you know, become a writer officially, but just to just to write something good, you know, and um, have that be awesome, at least to them, you know. Like for me, I don't care if it if anything I write ever becomes, you know, widespread, you know. I just think it'd be awesome to say, hey, you know what, I did this. I'm proud of it and i'm going to show my daughters this book and i'm going to be proud of it you know and so um it's just exciting and uh the thing with national novel writing month too is that it's not supposed to be a perfect novel at the end of the fifty thousand words you're not supposed to stop and edit every every day what you wrote um it's supposed to be getting the words on the page uh, getting the chapters written, getting the bones of the story, and then you know you can work, you can flesh it out. Uh, you know when you edit it after that month. You know if you if you get caught up on the editing, kind of like you encourage me, Daniel. You know don't worry too much about those things. Uh, you know just focus on you know getting it on paper uh, and laying the story out, and you can edit later after that month. Yeah, and well, I think one of the things having uh, you know I studied writing not only for short stories and fiction, but also uh, screenwriting and things when I was at college. And one of the things that I learned from that and in my own reading about, about writing and, and study is that the important thing is to just keep going through it because editing is really where everything takes, you know, comes together. And there will be, I forget who recommended this, but they said, you know, you, you write the story and you get to a point and you're like, man, the beginning needs this scene. Like, it doesn't work unless I have this scene. And they said, don't go back and write that scene or else you'll, you'll just start rewriting the thing over and over again, basically. And you'll never advance the story. And basically their piece of advice was you get to that point and you say, ah, oh, yeah, it needs that scene in the beginning. You say, I'm going to write from this point on as if that scene was in there get to the end and then go put it in. Yes. So then you, you continually are making progress and you're not just, and I, I still struggle with this. I mean, I, I can write a, a short story pretty well, but when I get past that point, I'm always like starting to tinker and like, Oh, I got to keep going forward. We'll see if I'm able to actually uh, continue. One of the things we talked about recently, as we've discussed writing and national Novel writing month is the idea of someone that's a heavy 
outliner or plotter and someone who is uh, a discovery writer who yeah. sort of figures things out as they go along. And I, I would consider myself more of a discovery writer. I enjoy the thrill of just figuring out what is this story about as I go along. But in order to actually accomplish this goal, I have actually written an outline for the first time for National Novel Writing Month. And I don't think, I'll, hopefully I'll get to the 50,000 words. <laughs> or, but uh, I, I think this is my, my, my best shot at it with this outline because I have a place where I'm trying to hit. You know, I, I have a goal, not only an end point in mind, but also a midpoint and a point in between there. And a point, you know. So I actually have uh, what I think is a decent outline. It's not the world's most original story, but that doesn't really matter. It's more about developing my own skills. Right. That's awesome. I think that uh, even at the very least, um, you know, even if you are more of a discovery writer, having that written down at least as an exercise is going to make you a better writer, even if you don't follow it perfectly. It's going to help you regardless. So that's I think it's awesome that you did that. Um, I'm still struggling. I don't know what I'm doing yet. I just, I have like 17 different things trying to floating around in my head and I'm just, I am all over the place. So uh, yeah, that's going to be, I got, it's it's October. Well, for me, it's October 30th. Uh, for Daniel, it's still the 29th. Yep. But, um, you know, I got two days to figure this out, what I'm actually going to write about. And then maybe try to throw together an outline. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be quite... I, I hope I do it. I'm going to try to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe we can even, you know, read a little bit of our stories if we, you know, do get some decent, decent way into them at some point on, uh, on the podcast. But, um, what, um, what are you going to be writing about? What's, what's your topic going to be? Right, sci-fi, so. probably sci-fi from what you said, but. No, actually I, I'm, I'm writing a, a fantasy story at this point. I have some science fiction ideas and I, I, because I'm sort of a science fiction snob, I take my ideas for science fiction a little bit more seriously than I do my fantasy sometimes. So those are like stewing around in my head, and they'll eventually get there when I have the skills. But uh, this this story I'm going to be writing about is I'm finally taking the advice of write what you know. So I have you know this awesome superhero and all. No, I, I uh, <laughs> it's a it's a story about uh, I was in the Navy and I was a hospitalman in the Navy. And I'm going to be writing a story about a hospital man. I mean, I, when I was in the Navy, I was in the reserves and I was, uh, you know, I, I was in a, a what's called a hot, you know, medical battalion and basically like a mobile ER. And, and so I, I was never out with, you know, getting shot at or anything like that. But the uh, character I'm going to be writing about is a, corpsman that served with the recon marines so this is sort of the marine part of the marine special forces and this uh, this guy he has gotten out of the navy he's trying to move on to a different part in his life and then he finds himself in a fantasy world and i've always i guess it, it comes from reading chronicles of narnia at an early age but i've always liked the stories where someone goes from the real you know the real world into a fantasy world and has to deal with that. And I've always felt let, let down from the opposite where someone from the fantasy world came to our real world because that always felt like a cop out. Like, oh man, you just didn't want to, like a movie especially. <laughs> like, oh, you just didn't want to take the time to actually create a fantasy world. You just took the easy way out. But so that's that's the basic idea is he, he gets put into this fantasy world and he's got to deal with what ensues. But I, you know, I, since I was in the medical profession and that's going to play into the story, I have an idea of how he's going to, you know, if I write from my perspective, at least how he's going to deal with some of the situations he's presented with. And I also have, you know, that knowledge base that I can, that I can draw from. But what, what about awesome. you? What are, what are some of the things you're thinking about writing about? Oh man, what am I thinking about writing about? Oh, well, what I was originally planning on writing about, I um, actually broke the rules of National Novel Writing Month. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, so I, I may just start right over. But um, you're not supposed to write anything now. You you can outline and you can plan, but you're not supposed to write until November comes around. And um, 
So I had started to write, and I think I had read it to you, um, just kind of about. Um, it was going to be. It was going to be based off of um, a lot of books I really like. So, like uh, one of the things, one of the ways that I think. Um, Guys like Rothfuss or Renshaw or Tolkien have drawn me into books really effectively as opposed to uh, a book like, uh, you know, the one by Sanderson I'm reading now is that um, they have a really nice, um, you know, kind of a happy, happy introduction. So you get introduced to the characters in the book in a way that that makes you feel very good and you're happy for them. And you know that can't last for very long because obviously there needs to be a conflict. But, um, you know, with Rothfuss, you know, pretty quickly, there's a lot of stuff that happens to Kvothe, the main character. Uh, with Redshaw, you know, we're we're kind of talking about that climax where everything kind of changes. And uh, you were talking about how he has to leave his home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so there, but, and, and even Tolkien, you know, you start out in the Shire and at least in the Lord of the Rings books and in the Hobbit. And, you know, you see this nice, happy place where you're kind of like, okay, I can kind of associate with these people to a point, And then they get thrust into this adventure where, where their uh, nice, safe world is no longer reality. And um, so what I was trying to do with my story was I wanted to start out with the idea of happiness. I wanted to, I want to make the reader feel happy and get, get emotionally invested with a novella. I don't think you have as much time to, uh, drag that out. So I was going to do kind of like, uh, you know, this happy scene of, of this main character, this guy, and, uh, you know, obviously the woman he likes or something, something else like that, where it's like, you know, you just get engrossed in the character and you start to like him, and then everything kind of falls apart quick. Uh, you know, and I, and I, toy with your emotions. I make you, I got somebody said, um, you know, about fiction, you know, why do you gut punch me in the fields? Uh-huh. And that's what I'm going for. You know, I want to gut punch you in the fields. I want to, I want to make you happy and I want to make you want more of the story. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea that I'm writing to, and I'm not sure how I'm going to get there. Um, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, kind of what I would like to write. I would really like to write something similar to Sleepy Ho- The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Irving Washington. Um, I listen to that at least once every October, along with Young Goodman Brown. I think that was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, I think those are good kind of fall, you know, Halloween kind of esque books. Uh, they're very short. I think Sleepy Hollow is about an hour and a half. I think that Young Goodman Brown is under an hour. Um, so they're very doable, but Irvin Washington, not quite to the same extent, but he, he kind of, you know, makes the world very immersive like Renshaw and like Rothfuss. And I think that's, I'm just drawn to that kind of writing. The problem that I face is I'm not that good of a writer and I'm, I'm not that good at writing descriptions. And so, um, I'm not going to take on that just yet, but, um, so your goal is to kind of write something that you, you you're you, you uh you're drawn to tragedy it seems with sleepy hollow and these other these other things that stuck out to you in, in yeah the, in King killer chronicles and Jonathan Renshaw's work I well you know I think I think the conflict I think that fantasy and, and really any book lends itself to that conflict and the books that at least I've appreciated the most usually are the ones with that that immense conflict and because I'm more and everybody reads differently, but like when I read a book, I'm really, I really get immersed in the characters. If I can, and even I think Sanderson talks about this in his, um, in his, his uh, courses at Brigham Young University. He says, you know, there are like there are three parts to a story, and he said, but the most important one I think is to get right is the character, because if you can make people, you know, feel for the character and, and want to know more about the character and get behind the character, you know, you can, you can pound through a book with, you know, maybe not the best plot if you like the character enough. And for me, I, you know, if I do like the character, I, I can suffer through, you know, some pretty harsh stuff if the character really is worth it to me. And so that's kind of how I'm writing towards, I suppose, uh, and, and what I'm aspiring to, it's just, uh, We've got a, just because that's what I like, you know? 
Um, and tragedy happens to be a great way for like, you know, just think about any time in your life, you know, where you have something great and then, you know, like the next moment, you know, tragedy strikes and then you're just looking towards that hope and you want that hope and you're willing to endure whatever it takes to get to that hope. And, um, I think that if you write the main character or the main characters well enough, um, you know, that can be a really strong tool. Uh, in a really great way to um, bring enjoyment to your readership, even if it's not always fun to read. Like the King Killer Chronicles, Rothfuss is just like, this is a tragedy. And, you know, I'm just always rooting for Kavoth. And it's like, I, I know this isn't accurate, but I feel like one out of every hundred pages, he gets a break. You know? <laughs> and um, well, I'm not And saying... then you know the end goal, because the, the way the story is set up, the way the book is written he's telling the story and he's already failed. Like he's already yeah. at his lowest point as he's telling the story of how he got there. Yes. And so you kind of know, like as much as I root for him, he ends up in this low place. Yes. Yes. And so that's kind of, that's kind of my, my motivation, my goal, how I'm kind of approaching it. Um, and, and I'm lost. So uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll fi you'll figure it out. I'm sure it's, you know, that's the thing about, about writing and about any sort of, artistic endeavor is you got to try and figure it out no one ever comes and just paints a masterpiece right off the bat or you know writes writes a masterpiece on their first draft in fact the people that think they do they usually have failed <laughs> yes yes that uh, that false hubris um but yeah i think the important thing is writing is fun it's a good way to express what's important to you to other people in a you know in a way that hopefully is enjoyable and edifying to them and and you know even if your writing isn't the best you know at the end of the day uh for me like i said you know i just want to i want to write something you know that's halfway decent that you know i can show to my daughters one day and say hey look you know you should try this and i want to encourage my daughters to to um you know do that if they want to too and so it's just something it's just something that you know if you enjoy writing you should just do yeah and uh, we would encourage everybody to even if you get a late start on national novel writing month it's a great time of the year to try and just start writing that novel that you have that stewing away in your brain and you're you've said oh someday i'll get to it well why not right now you know yes. write, write a couple of of words down and see how it goes and try to get it on paper. And even if it's not, you know, you think, Oh, this is terrible. It's not. The point is that you're improving, you're getting better. And, uh, I think that's a, a hopeful note for us to end the podcast on today. So, uh, we don't really have a, a nice catchphrase to sign us out, but, uh, we'll see you again next time. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it.